Welcome to Defender Fridays. Happy Friday to everybody. So so stoked to see many uh, many familiar faces, folks coming back week after week. I love it. It keeps me amped up. Love putting these on, knowing that uh, it gives folks a little, little uh, defensive topic to kind of noodle over uh, during the lunch break here, at least in Central Standard Time. Um, so the, uh, the guest today is actually yours truly. Um, I'm going to be uh, popping on to talk a little bit about Velociraptor, which is probably no surprise to anybody that's, that's followed me on social media or that's followed my blog. It's one of my favorite tools, uh, especially in the open source area. It's absolutely uh, one of the most game-changing open source tools for DFIR. And I don't know, anybody that's heard me talk about it before is like, yeah, Eric, I know. I know you love it. But like, I, I still talk about it because it's it's crazy to me. While it's, it has taken off in popularity, there's still a lot of practitioners that like have not gotten hands on with it. I'm like, what are you waiting for? Like, if you're using something that's more powerful, I don't even even if it's like off the shelf, like tell me about it because I'm curious because I've yet to see something that really comes like head to head with this thing. And the price is right. You know, it's free ninety nine or free thousand dollars, however you want to go about it. So uh, give me a moment here. I'll get my screen share going so that I can step you all through a little bit of uh, Velociraptor related uh, analysis. We're going to talk specifically today about, hang on, I got to move a couple windows here. We're going to talk specifically about process and network analysis, which is obviously a very fundamental uh, part of analysis during, you know, incident response or even just generic kind of SOC analyst work when you're, you know, trying to get down to ground truth about, you know, an alert that came into this, you know, from the seam or in the SOAR. Obviously, the next thing that the analyst generally needs to do is, well, let's go put eyes on that system and try to understand, like, what's going on, right? Because it's not always going to be this very obvious thing, like, oh, well, clearly, that's bad, right? This bad thing has happened. No, oftentimes it's like, well, I don't know. I mean, it, it looks like it might be bad, but I need to I need to know more about what's going on in that system. I need to do a little bit deeper dive. And I got to say, Velociraptor makes uh, really quick work of that. Okay, give me a quick sec here. I'll get this screen shared. All right, hopefully that's coming through clearly for you guys. Let's see. Yeah, can I get a thumbs up or a, okay, awesome. Yeah, it's, it's kind of funny uh, doing a screen share in Zoom. But uh, okay, perfect. Then uh, let me get this little Zoom bar out of here. Okay, it looks like it went away. Perfect. All right, so what I have here is a, uh, a Velociraptor server, if you will, that also happens to be running on the same system that I'm going to be doing some analysis on, which is kind of a funny way of doing it, right, if you think about it. But it's actually also a really cool and quick way to get an instant Velociraptor instance going um, without having to build or deploy a proper server. You can actually run the Velociraptor executable right here on the endpoint you're anal analyzing with the GUI command line argument. And what that does is it spins up a server and a client simultaneously on the system that you just ran that command on. So literally on this, this web app, this, this web UI I'm running, this is the system. This is the system that uh, that I'm going to be analyzing. And so um, I've got this little client right here checking in, some metadata about the client, and I can do anything out of the sun that I now need to do, all the things that Velociraptor is capable of. But let's keep it focused here. We're going to talk process and network baselining and analysis. So what I've done here to kind of give me something interesting to talk about on this call is I've imported some hunts that will run across uh, multiple, multiple systems, about 10 systems. And we're gonna focus in on, for instance, the processes running on those 10 systems, as well as the network activity we observe across those 10 systems. And this is what enables us to take advantage of one of the most powerful features of Velociraptor that few, fewer folks than, than I think should uh, know about this. Uh, that came out wrong, but not as many folks know about this as I think they should, right? It's the notebooks. Because if I run a hunt against 10 different systems for even something as simple as tell me, show me all the running processes. Well, I'm going to show you really quickly if I open up this notebook and get rid of the, the, the default limit of 50 because it's it's limiting only 50 results uh, on that hunt. I want to see how many, first of all, came at, came back from 10 systems, how many running processes. There were 799. OK, so. As anyone knows, right? Like that's a that's an unreasonable size, you know, size of data for me to just like start poking through, thinking 
I might find something out of the ordinary, right? Thinking I'm just going to randomly find evil.exe, and it's not often going to be that easy. So one of the first things that I want to show you all here is how we're going to use the, the power of the notebook to take this fairly large data set and whittle it down to something much more manageable. So again, just for anybody that's maybe never seen this UI before, I do want to make it clear kind of, you know, where I'm at and what I'm doing. So I'm in the hunt manager screen right now of the Velociraptor web UI. And in the hunt manager, this is where if I were to kick off a hunt across my endpoints to say, get running processes, and I go in here and I specify which artifact I'm going to run, I'm going to run the PS list artifact. When I kick off this hunt, over one or 10 or a thousand systems, it then shows up in the hunt manager um, where I can kind of keep track of the status of that hunt, make sure that it completes across all the endpoints. But then once the hunt is complete, that's where I clicked into the notebook here to analyze the results. I wanna take a closer look at what came back from all 10, 10 of my machines, show me all those running processes. So I just wanted to make sure everybody kind of knows how did I get here? Uh, do we, is that really Mike Cohen? I just see M. Cohen. Uh, Mike, if that's you, you got to tell me. That's the rule. If it is, I'm going to be stoked that you made it today. Super cool. And so, so yeah, if, if that's the M. Cohen, I'm thinking we might actually have uh, Mike Cohen on, who's actually the creator of Velociraptor. So, wow, super cool. Stoked that you could join us. Okay. Well, now the pressure's on. So, I got to be careful to, to not say anything dumb. Cool, so we've got the notebook, but I wanna clean it up. I wanna use the power of the VQL, which is the Velociraptor query language, to, to tidy up this notebook and make it a lot easier to find what I care about as an incident responder or a SOC analyst, right? Let's dig in. So what I'm gonna do is, I've got a little sample notebook here. I'm gonna kind of walk you through what it's doing. Notice all these columns down below. These columns are great, but not all of them are equally important to me, right? So what I'm doing is I'm choosing which columns do I actually want returned in my notebook so I can just kind of get rid of the noise and focus on the things of value. So I do want that process ID. I do want that parent process ID. I want the path to the executable. I want the command line arguments, you name it. Now, this one here is kind of funny, hash.sha256. What I'm doing is you see this hash column right here and how it's actually like crammed to be like really, really, really skinny because it's, it's too much data to show on this table. Well, I'm gonna kind of help it out by saying I only really want the SHA-256 out of, that, out of that, um, that JSON object. So just grab it and return it as the SHA-256 column. And then I'm gonna reach into the authentic code uh, data which you can also see contains a lot of data right here. This is all that stuff that we can we can learn from uh, the authentic code status of that binary, such as the code signer, the the, the certificate metadata, you know, who, who signed the certificate, all that good stuff. Well, generally, there's only one piece of data I care most about from that authentic code. It's whether or not that binary is trusted. Just tell me if it's trusted, right? I don't care about the rest, at least for now, for a quick pass. And then sure, give me the username. The username that the process is running as, fine, great, got it. So now that we've cleaned up our columns, and I'll just kind of show you really quick what that looks like before I talk about this where clause. You can see like right away, instant difference here, right? Instant difference in kind of how the data is being displayed to me, way easier to digest this. And folks, that's critical, right? As, a, as an analyst that needs to move fast, I need to, I need to be, you know, I need to be good at kind of cleaning up data to, to make it more digestible and manageable. So we've cleaned up our columns. I'm gonna put this where column back in, this where clause, sorry. So what this is effectively doing is this is saying, look, out of all these 799 processes, which I do not wanna look at one by one, just show me the ones that are authentic code, trusted equal to, equals untrusted. Fair enough, show me the unsigned processes. Now, why does that matter, right? Why, why does unsigned process matter to me? Well, um, it, it, you know, it's, it's a bit of a subjective uh, statement, but I'll say this. Um, what we're saying is I probably don't care about digitally signed trusted binaries because the likelihood of those being malware is extremely low. Not zero, but I'm saying extremely low. And unless you work in an, in an industry vertical that's like, you know, uh, zeroed in on by APTs, 
it's probably not in your threat model. You know, nobody's going to waste a stolen code signing certificate on commodity malware that just, you know, got mass emailed out. So what I'm getting at is generally um, by just zeroing in on unsigned binaries, we can oftentimes filter out a lot of pos false positives and just focus in on the things that matter. Um, Eric asked a really good question here. Would a hollowed process show up as trusted? So Eric, the, the tricky thing about that is if the process was hollowed, depending on the technique that was used to hollow it, right? What we're kind of, what we're working out here is from the process environment block. If it's still pointing to the original path of the original process, then it's a, it's a good chance that we're going to see that, you know, the binary, the original binary is in fact signed. Now I have not tested this theory. It's a really great question. I have not tested this theory, but I'm not going to, I can't say for sure that, um, that hollowing the process would be immediately obvious here. But there are several other ways that we can kind of go looking for that. But that's a topic for another day. I appreciate the question. But all right, let's go ahead and filter out those signed processes. Now, we went from 799 processes down to one. And remember, this is across 10 different systems, folks. Right? So 10 different systems, nearly 800 processes, and we got one. One untrusted process. Okay, so what are we thinking? Are we thinking, okay, this is clearly malware? Uh, it's, not, it's never going to be that easy, right? Uh, because it, the, the rule of, of code signing is that we can generally rely on it as a way of getting rid of legitimate software. Not all legitimate software is digitally signed. And so, but hey, we're one click away. If you notice right here in the web GUI, if I click on a, on a data type like an IOC, a hash or what have you, I get this really helpful context to say, well, sure, let's just find out what Virus Total has to say about that SHA-256. And we're probably going to find out pretty quickly this is a false positive. This is not the thing that we're looking for. But was that still worth doing? It was because it just it enabled us to very quickly answer the question, well, how common, how prevalent are unsigned processes in this environment? You can see right now they're not very common at all. OK, great. So we can kind of continue moving on. So if we know that we're not just going to find some unsigned process that's going to, you know, immediately give us away or give away kind of what's going on here, we're going to want to switch tactics a little bit, right? So because let me give you another situation where the whole code signing thing might throw you for a loop. LOL bins, LOL bins, right? If anybody that's unfamiliar, living on the land binaries, really, really common. Well, there's there's thousands. There, there's so many LOL bins. But I would say, you know, some common ones like, you know, just your command interpreters like cmd.exe, powershell.exe. Can these be used for evil? Of course they can, right? Absolutely. They're used for evil all the time. Well, the tricky thing about that is those are signed processes, right? So even though they're signed and legitimate does not mean they can't be abused and, and misused, right? So that's why we're not done yet, right? We're going to have to kind of keep going. So the next thing I'm going to add in here, we've got a, a little notebook example I'm a big fan of, and I'll kind of walk you through what we're, what we're going to do here. So if I already know there's a list of LOL bins that are commonly abused, right? And these are going to be digitally signed. So that's why we're taking the whole uh, code signing status out now. And we're going to focus instead on common LOL bins, right? CMD.exe, PowerShell, anything to do with script, like W script, C script, what have you, run DLL. Commonly abused um, LOL bins, filtering for those, but we're also adding additional OR criteria. Maybe I also care about any process that's running, either, either running from or has command line arguments uh, involving a temporary location on the file system, right? C Windows temp, app data local temp, right? Any of the number of temp temporary locations that we know are interesting. And then maybe as I continue through my analysis, I, you know, I uncover there's various false positives around some common, well-known Windows binaries, and I simply don't want these in my results. Now, folks, let's be clear, right? Like this notebook may have taken me 15, 20 minutes to craft, spending time with the results and analyzing, oh, you know, these are very noisy and I do a little bit of OSINT and they're clearly okay. These are normal things. So I'm just simply excluding them from my results because what I'm going to do next is I'm going to I'm going to do a little bit of a, what we call stacking. So if I have a large data set of many, many different systems across the environment and I'm analyzing processes of all of those systems, one of the coolest tricks you can do 
is simply ask the question, show me the least or most common processes with their command lines in this environment, because by simply looking at the rarest entries, maybe that's how we find our outlier. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this notebook and see what we get. Well, that was easy. <laughs> it's kind of kind of too easy, right? Maybe because I, I I you know skipped a few steps by already excluding the noisy false positives. But let's just say there would have been a handful more had I not filtered out these two uh, noisy ones. Oh, it's almost like uh, too easy because we just landed on definitely something worth talking about. Okay, so what do we have? We've got a single process um, with a count of one here um, that met our criteria. And remember, our criteria was any one of the, these commonly abused LOL bins or reference to a temporary location and excluding out these noisier uh, items here. And we have one result to look at. So what's wrong with this picture? We got run DLL 32, right? Now for anybody unfamiliar with run DLL 32, it does one thing, it has one job. Anybody wanna take a stab? What do you think run DLL 32 is used for? Speak up folks, this is supposed to be an interactive uh, format. I here. think it might run DLLs. Get out of here, Jeff McJunkin, with your wisdom. Yes, yes, in fact, run DLL32's primary purpose is to run DLLs, right? Um, so most often when you see run DLL32 running on a system, most often, almost always, you will see in the command line arguments the path to a DLL. Okay, great, so we see we see a DLL in the path here, the command line arguments for run DLL32, but I don't know. I'm not I'm not crazy about this. Anybody have uh, thoughts as to why? What do you think? What do you what's weird maybe stands out about this? Temp. Yes, Darren. We got a DLL sitting in a temporary location. Now, okay, maybe that's normal. Who knows, right? Like that could be something. But what I think is interesting about this is remember, we started with nearly 800 process events across 10 different systems, and we came back with a count of one of this instance right here. So whatever this is, it's weird and it's rare, right? And that's like two strikes, right? So I would certainly wanna spend a little bit of time understanding maybe what's going on with this DLL, where did it come from? If I can go and, and get my hands on it or grab a hash of it, that's absolutely the next thing I'd be considering doing. But you see, this didn't come up in our previous, uh, in our previous query because run DLL32 is a signed process. So it's not going to show up when I'm only looking for unsigned processes. So we have to sort of be uh, mindful of that. Um, let's see, make sure there's a couple questions coming in. Yeah, Jeff, I would 100% agree, right? Um, when kind of looking for suspicious executions or just worthwhile executions, absolutely focusing inside of user profile directories, app data, local, and all those kind of places um, are usually worthwhile. You shoot even just like the downloads directory, right? Because uh, it's not something that happens super common it's going to happen but it's generally always at least worth putting eyes on um and then eric's asking if this is a live search okay so so what we're doing right now eric is actually not live but we're going to get there and i better get there quick time is moving um what i'm doing right now is i'm looking through basically a, a historical collection from 10 different systems but i'm about to shift gears and we're going to do some live stuff now Okay, so uh, so we might only have time to talk processes today, and that's okay because uh, network stuff is cool, but processes are generally where the most interesting data is. So, all right, I'm going to shift gears here here real quick, and I'm going to kick off Live Hunt because what we were just looking at was, in fact, uh, historical data. But I want to see what's going on in the system I'm on right now. So we're going to get processes on this machine here that we're currently on. And I'm gonna accomplish that with the PS list artifact. Take a peek here. And it's just giving me kind of a preview of this artifact, what the, the raw VQL looks like within. So you can kind of see how it assembles the data set that comes back. It's not just getting a list of running processes. It's enriching those with, for instance, the hashes of those process binaries, the authentic code status, so on and so forth. So super cool. When I go here to configure parameters, I can specify additional options like do I want to uh, use a regex pattern to only you know, bring back run DLL 32s or what have you? No, I want them all. Um, and I'm going to enable this feature right here, which is going to use the process tracker. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And then defaults here, 
quick review of our hunt there. We're fine. We're going to launch it. And it should execute that right away because I told it to. And that shouldn't take very long at all. It's just a local hunt on the same box. And then when it runs, we're going to take, uh, we're going to take a quick peek at <clears throat> some of the results we get back here. All right, and it's done. So we'll pop it in the notebook and we're gonna open that up, edit it. I'm gonna get rid of that limit 50 because I am curious like what, what the total results are. Just see how many we got back. Okay, 546 on one system. <laughs> All right, that's more than a few. So we're gonna need to definitely apply some data reduction here. So you already know the name of this trick, right? We're just simply looking for, show me those unsigned processes. Now, this is cool. This is cool because even though we had 546 on a single system, see how quickly I can reduce that data with simply looking for unsigned processes. And why is that, folks? It's because on your modern Windows 10, Windows 11 systems, folks, um, uh, code signing is becoming the default, it's becoming the norm. So that's why we're able to start relying on this technique more because unsigned processes are less common than they were, especially in like the Windows 7 days, um, especially when you're talking about system level processes, right? Anything running out of system 32 and things like that, almost always these things are going to be digitally signed. So that's why this data reduction technique works. Uh, JP saw it. We're, uh, we're looking at, apparently we're looking at Bill Lumberg's system. Oh, Bill. He apparently needs us all to come in on Saturday. So we've we've whittled our 547 down to three. Has anyone spotted the weird thing here? I mean, even without using virus total or looking up hashes, I think we I think we have an idea of where our analysis would start. We got an exe running out of Bill Lumberg's downloads directory called Burp Suite Pro Cracked. But I'm not convinced, right? I, I would still love to know, like, is this um, is this for sure bad or is this just something weird happening? I want to show you all a really cool trick we can use here. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in a notebook example that shows off a little bit more of the awesomeness that VirusTotal can do here. So I'm going to cut this out. Let's see if we can paste this in. I kind of crafted this on the fly before, right before the call started. So I hope it works. But I'm going to talk you through what it's going to do. So we are now taking the same data that we have down here. We're taking that PID, the process parent, uh, the exe command line, and SHA-256. And what we're going to do is we're going to continue to filter out the, the trusted binaries, only bringing in the untrusted ones. Because the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take each of the SHA-256s, and I'm going to use the server-side artifact inside Velociraptor to query virus total right there from the from the server and get answers for those hashes. Now, let me be clear about what's happening here. All it's doing is it's taking the SHA-256 of that sample and it's gonna query virus total for it. So it's not like uploading the sample or anything like that, it's just checking to see, does it know about this hash? And yes, I'm aware I'm giving you all an API key here that will be burned as soon as we get off this call. But, um, and it's a free one, so there's not really much to get there anyway. Let's see if we get any good luck here. Hey, hey, that's not terrible. So here's what's happened. And don't mind the, the kind of red color text down here. I've had folks ask me like, does this mean it broke? I'm like, no, no, just for whatever reason, the, 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 the verbose feedback it gives us about making those web requests to VirusTotal shows up in red. It doesn't mean anything's broke. But here's what we've got. Now we have a new column over here on the right-hand side showing the virus total results for each of those SHA-256 hashes, right? Folks, this makes, I mean, this, this makes a quick work of eliminating the false positives, right? Because 074, 064, and of course, and I'm sure Jeff's over there, his mind's going, he's like, yeah, that doesn't always mean it's uh, it's good. That's true. But I'm going to say it's not, not likely to be the thing that I'm looking for right now. But here I've got an EXE running out of a download location that's already strike one. And is untrusted, that's strike two, and null, null. Anybody want to take a guess at what that what that's trying to tell us? Null, null. Never been seen before. Never seen before, right? Folks, anybody that's used virus total a little bit probably knows that for some reason or another, everything under the sun has been seen by virus total down to like a random JPEG that came with your Windows 10 installation, it's been uploaded to VirusTotal. 
uh, you know, through automated processes, through, you know, curious analysts. I don't know. But like what I'm getting at is it's not super common. You're going to come across something um, unless you made it yourself. Like it's not super common. You're going to come across something that's never been seen before by virus total. So um, it's actually pretty important when you see something like this, like a null null or you query VT and it's like, I've never seen that. But it's definitely an executable. It's ran in your environment. I mean, that's kind of the moment of escalation for you. Of uh, hmm, that to me, that's nearly as bad as seeing you know seventy four seventy four, right? Like that's it's not great uh, because it could mean that this is something that's been you know uh, handcrafted, you know, artisanal malware uh, made specifically for your organization, and it's just never been observed anywhere else. Therefore, never seen virus total, and that would be a red flag to me for sure. And keep in mind, folks, that this little virus total trick uh, that I showed you, and I'm going to give you all a link in a minute, by the way, if you want to get some of these notebooks and kind of uh, work through them yourself and many others, um, I'll give you a link in the chat here in just a minute. But I do want to kind of step through what we're doing here again. Once more, I'm just looking at all those processes, folks. And this could have been hundreds of processes, right, that I want to do this enrichment with. And I'm, you know, filtering out the ones that I don't want to waste my API key on my virus total API key, it probably doesn't make sense to query virus total for signed binaries, okay? Because if you are the one that happens to find a signed binary that also is malware, I mean, you're gonna have a good day. Like it's gonna be a, a press worthy event. So it's just not likely. So I'm not gonna burn my API key on those signed binaries. And then I'm also notice with this statement right here and SHA-256, I'm simply saying, I only want results that have a SHA-256 because that's what my API lookup requires. So don't, don't try to query virus total for empty values. And then this right here is where we take the results of this hunt and we feed them to that server side artifact and do those lookups. So again, I could have done this with 500 processes across a thousand machines and gotten really quick answers about what's malware, what's not, et cetera. Just be mindful of, of course, the limitations of the virus total API, because the free one is not gonna let you do that many queries. I think it's something like, um, I don't know, a handful a minute and, and probably like a, a couple hundred a day. I can't remember what the limit is, but that's definitely something to be mindful of. Um, let me pause here and see if I, I lost any uh, questions here in the chat. Looks. Good, awesome, awesome. So before I forget, let me grab a link. I wanna show you all here something really quick. So um, actually I'll just drag this over to my uh, my screen. I'll drop the link and show you what the link is to. So for anybody that wants to dig in more with Velociraptor, <clears throat> I highly recommend checking out uh, a talk I gave uh, a little over a year ago called Live Incident Response with Velociraptor. And not only do I give you like a full hour long live IR demonstration, but I think maybe even more useful than that is I give you all of the notebook examples that I used. And if nothing more, I just hoped that folks would use this as inspiration for what you can do with those notebooks. Like, for instance, when I run a hunt that looks for the presence of a suspicious file on a system and I know that anywhere that file is seen, that system is compromised. Well, I can use the notebook to automatically apply labels to systems based on the results of a hunt. Right. So, you know, I could have made it say if virus total came back with results, then slap a label that this system's got malware on it. Right. Um, got some really cool notebooks in here for looking for lateral movement, further analyzing processes, kind of like we just did today. But, you know, giving you some examples of those grouping and stacking and things like that that'll make you make uh, help you make quick, uh, you know, uh, or come to quicker conclusions when looking through larger data sets. I even give you the virus total example showing you kind of how to structure that query, um, you know, where to provide your API key. There's a more secure way, by the way, than putting it in the notebook. But for, for brevity, I've just got it there in the notebook and lots of other good examples here. So please do check that out if you have a chance. Uh, the link is now in chat. And uh, that brings us pretty much to the top of the hour. I didn't really give much time for questions, but I'm hoping that uh, if anyone had one, it hit the chat. Oh, wait a second. Did I miss a Q&A? Oh, I did. Yeah. So Javier says, do you guys offer this type of training? OK, uh, well, you guys is, is, is kind of open. But um, um, so Whitney and I actually have run a training for Velociraptor uh, at uh, Wild Wild Hacking Fest. I imagine we'll probably be there again next year. 
And I will just throw out a quick teaser. Keep an eye out for um, an on-demand course uh, of the same nature. Mm. One last thing is we're running out of time. Anybody here that knows Lima Charlie integrates with Velociraptor, um, that's super cool, but it's about to get even cooler. I'm about to share a spoiler that nobody else has seen before. Uh, Whitney is building out the ability to kick off Velociraptor triage acquisitions inside of Lima Charlie that will automatically send the results of those acquisitions, if Zoom would get out of my way, send the results of those acquisitions via uh, th using webhooks and API calls into Plazo, into TimeSketch. So literally one click in Lima Charlie kicks off that triage and you're gonna have timelines sitting in TimeSketch, however long it takes to process the evidence later fully automated pipeline. Keep an eye out. We're going to have an open source project to drop on you guys probably in the next few weeks. So, all right. Sorry to spoil the surprise, Wit. That's all Wit's hard work right there. More to come. But anyways, folks, have a great rest of your Friday. Join us in Slack. We'll see you same time, same place next week.